we go through this over and over again as abortion providers. We've been warned that we are over the line. Over the line. Really? What did they say? They said you're over the line. We're redefining the kilogram. It affects literally everything in our lives. Attorney General William Barr went on Fox News today to lay out his reasons for investigating the Russia investigation and the people in his own department who started it. Because I think people have to find out what the government was doing during that period. If we're, if we're worried about foreign influence, for the very same reason, we should be worried about whether government officials abuse their power and put their thumb on the scale. The suicide rate for American children is rising and the gap between girls and boys is shrinking. According to a study out today, based on 40 years of data, since 2007, the rate for girls 10 to 14 has been going up much faster than the rate for boys. White boys are the most likely to commit suicide, black girls the least. The government is negotiating with no authority and no ability that I can see to actually deliver anything. British Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn quit talks today with Prime Minister Theresa May over her Brexit plan. But she's still planning to send that same deal to Parliament for the fourth time, meaning that more than a month after the EU gave May an extension, she still has nothing to show for it. Thousands of people celebrated today after Taiwan's parliament passed a bill to legalize same-sex marriage, becoming the first Asian nation to do so. Alabama Women's Center, may I help you? Did you come in for your follow-up appointment? On Wednesday, Governor Kay Ivey signed a bill that put Alabama on the path to banning all abortions in the state. On Thursday, at the Alabama Women's Center, not much changed. The center is one of three abortion clinics in the state, and it's the only one that provides second trimester abortions. The protesters are regulars. The volunteer escorts know them and try to shield the patients to make getting in the door a little bit easier. Thou shalt not kill. Women wait with friends, spouses, moms, sometimes their exes. They have to have someone help them get home after the procedure. And the staff carries on as usual. It's probably, when's the last time you had sex? The phones ring a lot. Confused women have been calling, trying to figure out if they can still get an abortion. But mostly the calls are routine. So, take some Benadryl. The new law isn't in effect yet. It will be at least six months before doctors will have to stop performing abortions in Alabama. And the law is likely to be blocked by a court challenge long before then. In any case, laws designed to close this clinic have become a regular thing for Dalton Johnson. In 2017, Vice News was at this same clinic talking about a different law, a different court challenge. You think that you, you would eventually get to a place where they would say, OK, you know, we can't pass any more laws, this is it. But then they come up with something else. You watch that and you see what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. What's your thought? Insane. But the one thing is, at least they finally came out and said it, that they just want to make it illegal all, all together. You know, before they used to, to hide behind uh, women's health and safety. Since you decided to open a clinic in 2001, how many like legal hoops have you had to jump through as like new laws have been created here? Can't even count. You know, I kind of feel almost at home in in the federal in court a, in, in the federal courthouse, at least in in in, um, in Montgomery. It's been admitting privileges the zoning, the building codes, and probably, probably some more. I just can't even think. I mean, it goes on and on. It's been, it's been nonstop. Johnson assists with abortions, but he's not a doctor. Yashika Robinson is. She arrives at the clinic after doing her other job, delivering a healthy seven pound, one ounce baby girl. When you went to work today, what were you thinking? I usually never say this, but I kind of, I felt defeated today, initially. Like, 
It's hard in a place where we don't have people that really represent us, um, that are making decisions for all of us. So, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. You know, the thing about it is we've been through bad things before. We go through this over and over again as abortion providers. So, you know, sometimes I'm hard on myself and I ask, why do you act like you're so shocked? All day, the staff goes from room to room. LaShonda Pynchon, the only full-time nurse, helps women get settled and sedated. About 20 women were scheduled for abortions Thursday. Why do you do this? Who else is going to do it? It's very hard to get somebody to do this job. I've yeah. been here for about 14 years. Even though I've never personally had a termination, I've assisted about 20,000. And I feel like this should be as common as going to the doctor and having a bunion removed. Nobody ridicules you, nobody asks you, why did you have that not taken off the side of your foot? So nobody should be ridiculing you or asking you, why did you remove that fetus from your ears? You're a nurse. When do you think personhood begins? I think personhood begins when the fetus is born. I don't think that you're gonna give rights to something that's still inside of my body. And that is inside of my body. So if it's not outside of me, it doesn't have rights. Period. When people come in, what states are they usually coming from? Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, um, Louisiana, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of the late term procedures that it's illegal to have them done in their state. So they're yeah. traveling to us for those procedures. We talked to one of those women after she ended her pregnancy. She drove about an hour and a half from a town in Tennessee to have the procedure, and an ex-boyfriend came with her. She didn't want her face shown or her name used. I feel like there's some situations that are best to not bring a child into. And if you feel like you're in that position, you have a right, not only as a person, but as a mother. Like, this is a decision I had to make as a mom. I'm a single mom of three kids. I have nothing to offer this child. I thought about adoption. The father wouldn't sign his rights over for me to let someone else adopt him. So it's kind of like, so that's where we're at. But to make it illegal, I feel like it's not fair. She tried to get an abortion in her own state, but had trouble getting an appointment. So she came to Huntsville. Can I ask if you've ever had an abortion before? No. This is your first time? Yeah. The further along this drug out, the worse it was, you know, the harder it was. I stood up crying and I prayed about it, and it's definitely not an easy decision. I don't think this is something that should be taken lightly. Maybe if they've regulated it a little bit, but I don't think it's right for them to completely take it away. The clinic is supposed to close at 4 p.m. There's a regulation for everything, including how late they can see patients. Y'all could sell this place and open a clinic in a state that wants you there. Would you ever consider doing that? That would mean we're quitting. And um, quitting is just really not in my vocabulary. It's just not something that I would think to do. One of the things that we need to do as providers is go where we're needed. We just do what we can to make sure we get everybody taken care of. That's as far as President Trump is going to deny that the U.S. is heading for war. For days now, there have been reports of escalating tensions, the U.S. military drawing up contingency plans for an invasion. But how much of it's real? How much is bluster? And how much is just confusion? What we know is that earlier this week, commanders of America's forces in the Middle East said they'd learned U.S. interests in the region were being targeted by a threat emanating from Iran. Not many people seem to know exactly what that threat is, Congressional leaders got a classified briefing yesterday, but only after Lindsey Graham complained about being in the dark. And I would urge the State Department and DOD to come down here and explain to us what's going on, because I have no idea what the threat stream is beyond what I read in the paper. The intelligence could have been an overreaction, but it was enough to cause the evacuation of U.S. Embassy staff in Iraq on Wednesday, a measure taken only in truly dire circumstances. The apparent fear was that Iranian proxies in Iraq 
were about to make some kind of a move against American personnel. There are hardline Shia militia groups in Iraq that are backed by Iran, but that's nothing new. Those groups have been there for years, so it's unclear why they decide to attack now. Jeffrey Prescott dealt with this constellation of threats as senior director for Iran policy on President Obama's National Security Council. If you were looking for um, threatening information about Iran, you can find it. There are acts that Iran is taking all across the region every day uh, that could be seen as provocative or threatening. Obviously, we disagree with a lot of the way that Iran conducts its foreign policy and its military and quasi-military activities and support for terrorism across the region. So we have a lot of things to be worried about. But there's, in some ways, almost a constant stream of information that you could read as more or less threatening. Figuring out what part of that is an escalation that demands response is a perpetual challenge for Washington. And that long distance guessing game only got harder when President Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal 18 months ago. We will not continue down a path whose predictable conclusion is more violence, more terror, and the very real threat of Iran's nuclear breakout. There's another potential problem too. While the president reportedly wants to avoid a war with Iran, there are others in his administration who maybe don't. I do think it's worrying that Trump has surrounded himself uh, by people like Bolton and Pompeo, who uh, very clearly uh, are interested, and in, certainly before they took their current positions, were very vocal about wanting a conflict with Iran. And we know how devastating that would be. We've been through this uh, before, obviously, with the Iraq War. And so when you see reports of military plans for uh, large troop deployments in the region, when you see contingency plans for escalating the situation if there's a provocation, that makes me really worried. And, and ultimately, um, that lands on the desk of uh, President Trump. The Eurovision Song Contest may be the most frivolous competition in the world. Start with the word Euro, which is defined so loosely that more than 50 countries can compete, including Australia. Then there's Song, which in some cases is pretty loosely defined too. Still, Eurovision draws more eyeballs than the Super Bowl, and it's one of the few events where a global audience actually watches together. Because frivolity is the point. But this year, Eurovision is being held in the home of last year's winner, Israel. And here, politics dominates all. We see Eurovision as dancing on Palestinian graves. Amor Barghouti is a Palestinian founding member of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement. The government isn't funding this or isn't providing the majority of funding. This is a, a lot of people who are turning up to enjoy art, cheesy music and have a good time. Mm -hmm. And why should they be stopped from doing that? It's a matter of whether you want to use art to whitewash apartheid, to whitewash crimes, siege, ethnic cleansing, occupation, demolition of homes. If you really want to be apolitical, which sounds really ironic, it's as political as it gets. But regardless, if you want to be apolitical, don't hold Eurovision in a state that is guilty of apartheid, occupation, and ethnic cleansing. So that's a political statement in that's itself? That's a very political statement in itself. Bonsoir, France! To its millions of fans, Eurovision is a celebration of camp, kitsch, and cultural unity. Political protest is banned. But one act this year is breaking ranks and confronting the issue head on, Hatari. That's Icelandic for hater, self-styled BDSM techno-punks. Their contest entry, Hate Will Prevail, is a song about the dangers of populism and oppression. We've been warned that we are... Over the line. Over the line. Really? What did they say? They said, you're over the line. Just that that's it? <laughs> no, they phrased it very elegantly and they complimented our performance and they said, of course, they don't want to change how we see the world or our life opinions, but uh, uh, 
on obviously. Made it very clear that we had reached the limit of the EBU's tolerance. For... Was that because you used the, the A word, you said apartheid? Yeah, I think that was the line. The argument from uh, the Eurovision organizer side and the broadcaster, the Israeli broadcaster, is that there shouldn't be a mix between art and fun and politics. This is, of course, not true because uh, you can't untie art from its context, especially here, especially now. The boycott message has found Israeli support too. We're trying to raise our voice to the Israeli audience and to the international audience. What do you think of the message, which is that Eurovision is a celebration for queerness, liberalism, uh, all things camp and kitsch? I think it could be nice if it was truth. First of all, culture is uh, something with political, okay? Uh, singing like songs are political, there's always been political. Uh, and second of all, it's not all, only cultural, it's also financial. But for many of the Israeli fans who shelled out up to $350 for Eurovision tickets, the backdrop to this year's contest is a little wearying. Everything is based on politics. It doesn't matter what we do, they always look at us in a different way. Eurovision maintains that it's above the fray, and so far its message is holding. Madonna, who's playing the halftime show, says she won't let politics stop her from performing. And about 100,000 people will watch tomorrow's final at Tel Aviv's Eurovision Beach Festival. Okay. <laughs> John Olasand runs the show and has been involved with the contest for 21 years. It's important to distinguish a bit. What we mean with a non-political event is the three TV transmissions and everything that's in here and in the bubble we create. We have to keep that free of politics. But there's a very thin line, isn't there, between being non-political and then freedom of speech as well. Iceland called Israel an apartheid state and they say as a result they've been explicitly warned by Eurovision and threatened with being thrown out. No, not because of that, but because we, were, we, we talked to them and we asked them not to make political statements in, in here and on the stage. But of course they are free to express their opinions. Chances of this year's contest are actually being disrupted are minimal and most of the show's global audience will be more focused on the glitter than the protests. But for Hatari, just getting their message heard is already a success. Everyone who goes on stage is making a political statement, whether they are aware of that fact or not. Monday is World Metrology Day, which honors the study of measurement. While it may not seem possible, this year's Metrology Day is going to be even nerdier than usual. That's because it'll mark the official redefinition of a fundamental unit of science, the kilogram. So last November, the world's metrology community gathered in Versailles, naturally, to vote on it. So how are you feeling? Excited, bit nervous. Because we're redefining the kilogram, which is just insane. <laughs> is that a big deal? Yeah, a huge deal. It affects literally everything in our lives. For the past 143 years, the kilogram has been defined by an object called the international prototype that's stored in France. It's the thing against which every scale is ultimately calibrated, affecting everything from the price of fruit to your blood test results. A yes vote means changing the kilogram's definition to one based on a fundamental constant of nature called Planck's constant, and putting an end to the use of physical objects to define the international system of units. Comment vous expliquez l'importance de, de cet événement? Ben, ça, là, c'est compliqué. <laughs> c'est compliqué parce que justement, c'est une, une véritable révolution. You know, in, in metrology, if we do our work right, then nobody will notice. But if we screw up, everybody will notice. Stefan Schlominger was part of the American team that helped make the change happen. 
So here's my Planck number. I carry it around with me now for the rest of my life. The thing below it says, à tous les temps, à tous les peuples. Why does it say that? So this is this motto of this metric system for all times, for all people. Every person can access it and can use it. Tell me about the history of the kilogram. So this all started out shortly before the French Revolution. At that time, there were different systems of measurements in different kingdoms and dukedoms and what have you. And it was very difficult for commerce because you would travel and, you know, the measurements would be different, so you have to adjust your prices. So people wanted to have one system that is the same everywhere. So they decided to use the Earth as a template, and they used that circle from the pole to the equator, divided it in 10 million pieces and called this a meter. To the kilogram now, they took the meter, divided it in 10 parts, and this is called a decimeter. And now you make a decimeter cubed and fill it with water, and this corresponds to a liter. And a liter of water was a kilogram. But it was a lot of work. And then I made an artifact out of platinum iridium. And this is what was called the international prototype of the kilogram. So every mass measurement in the world traces back to this kilogram here. We asked to see the prototype, but that's not exactly allowed. So all we got was this replica. The actual kilogram stays locked away, and there's definitely no touching. So the kilogram itself is always per definition a kilogram. So if you leave a fingerprint there, it is per definition still a kilogram, but the mass of the whole world would have changed. That's why scientists proposed a change in the definition. But it's not the only reason. The international prototype isn't exactly accessible. So the kilogram right now is in some vault, and the vault is in a room, and in order to get to the room, you need three keys. So there's three keys that is distributed to three different people. They all need to get together, open the door, they need the combination for the vault, then you open the vault, and in the vault you will see this international product of the kilogram. It sounds like you think that this is a much better system. From a philosophic standpoint, it's a much better system because it's artifact-free. If you want to talk to an alien civilization, and what are you going to talk about with these people? You talk about physics because there's no other topic worthwhile talking about. There's nothing <laughs> there's else nothing you would else. want to talk to aliens about. <laughs> and, and what would the aliens say? How do you determine mass? If we say, our kilogram is such that Planck's constant has this value. We are on speaking terms immediately. The people who have been working on the kibble balance, I want you to stand up. On November 16th, after a series of speeches, the vote began. Canada. Même chose en français. Oui. Oui. Ah. <laughs> Come here. China. Yes. Denmark. Denmark. Yes. Yes. Yes, we. I heard yes. The vote was unanimous, so thank you so much. Um. And just like that, the hunk of metal that's governed our reality for more than 100 years would be replaced. The moment the vote went through and, you know, they said it was unanimous, what was going through your mind? I, I was just overcome by emotion, you know, I just couldn't believe it. The whole world is basically here and voted yes, and mm -hmm. excitedly yes. You yeah. know, I, I think it was really touching. It was really, really nice. The last artifact is gone now, but, you know, I think we replaced it with something better. So on Monday, the world gets a brand new kilogram. As for the prototype, it'll stay in the vault for now. It's still going to take three keys and a code to get to it. fucking stupid. I don't have a uterus, so therefore, it's none of my business what anybody does with their uteruses. It's all about control. This is law, or lack thereof, is going to turn large parts of the southeastern United States into an even greater abortion desert. It's draconian, and it's backwards. If you don't have ovaries, you should not have an opinion because it's not your body. I really do think that the GOP Southerners are wanting to overturn Roe versus Wade. However, I think it is the most unsafe and selfish way of doing so. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. 